Hello. Thank you for joining us today for today's episode of We Will Get Through This, Transformative Leadership for Disruptive Times. I'm Scott Immig, and again, I'm here with my colleague, John Fischetti from the University of Newcastle in Australia. And this is an exciting time to be here. John, it's great to see you. How have you been doing the past few days? Doing well, Scott. It's a beautiful day here in the early autumn, and it's a fantastic opportunity we have in front of us to think differently. It's, it's a really stressful time for a lot of people, though, I know. It is. And, you know, just, just to reiterate, the purpose of this podcast is really to bring um, principles together, to bring ideas together that could help uh, school leaders dialogue, share ideas from around the world. Um, basically to talk about how do we utilize this time at home or this time in this transformed world to, to actually affect real change. Because I think one thing that we, we seem to agree on is the way things have gone traditionally, it's, it's probably time for us to be rethinking that. John, um, today's focus is what counts as innovation. So when you think about that, there's something that comes to mind. Yeah, I think let's talk with a couple of maybe critical examples, if you don't mind, Scott. Can you believe it's episode 15 of, of this journey? We'll see. We'll look forward to when it's uh, we got through this instead of we will get through this. But I think let's give a couple examples from our work together. We've spent some time working in different locations around the world, but particularly around um, this part of Australia and with some schools who are fantastic and the colleagues are great. But one example is where we work with an innovation team at a school that's fantastic. And this group of teachers, you would say, are the best of the best. And they were working hard on rejigging things. And then after the work we were doing with them on future-focused thinking and embedding some skills, um, we, we really had a planning session with them. And they came back to us and said, well, this is all fine, but we have no time in the 2020 schedule or the 21 schedule to build this in. So we could entertain doing some of this stuff in 2022. And what we're doing is interdisciplinary teaching with a project focus and maybe some different kinds of assessment. It wasn't really all that radical to begin with, but they could book us basically in two years. And it was, mm -hmm. we were sort of shocked that that was something we could actually start tomorrow if we wanted to. And it seemed like here's the team of the century, their innovation team going like, well, we're all set. We've got this school year figured out. We got next year figured out. We'll, we'll see in a couple of years. It was like put us back that all these things we were trying to purport were actually fine, but they were going to happen in such a slow pace, it, it almost seemed um, like we'd wasted our time and their time as well. Yeah, I, I remember that example very well. Um, you know, we've had other examples where we've actually had the opportunity to actually work closely with the school. There was, there was an example where we, we went in and we did eight professional development sessions. There was a team of four of us from the university, and we went in at a couple week intervals over a course of basically an entire year. And I remember focusing on you know, teaching and learning and rethinking assessment and rethinking well-being and really focusing on coaching and disheartening at the last, at the very last session to have some of the teachers convey to us, you know, this was a really great experience. We liked it when you'd pull us out and we'd do these activities, but probably most likely not going to be implementing these ideas. And that, oh boy, that was a gut punch. Yeah, it's rather stunning. I, I still don't get over it because this was one of the most exciting and dynamic teachers, basically, we'll never use this. Um, and it may be just a failure of our facilitation that that pointed out more than anything else. But what I really, really want and think this episode could be about is about, so what are, actually are we trying to innovate? And your question to me a couple of minutes ago was, was more around, in my mind, so in a, one of the courses I teach about the future of teaching and learning, the students are second year students trying to find a model of innovation around the world that looks like some exciting things are actually happening. Mm -hmm. And they're asking me, well, does some things like where they're building in uh, a scripted curriculum, a direct instruction approach, uh, a pretty back to basics view of teaching and learning count. There's a school in Sydney that removed laptops and they went back to teaching only handwriting and assessments are only done in old sort of blue books. That hasn't worked out for them too well, by the way, as we've transitioned to home learning, they've had to go back and figure out where the laptops could have been. So they may be already jumping to the 21st century, but I don't count those as innovations. They may be fine and I'm not gonna criticize a school for doing what they think's right, but that's just doubling down on what we've been doing. 
it's it's like doing the way things the way we have done them and counting it as innovation and there's not not that there isn't merit in the rigor or even the need for the handwriting or the need for some version of phonemic awareness and and using approaches that have been tried and true but just saying we're going to only have um, direct instruction as the pedagogy of choice, which one advocate for education has purported for all of New South Wales, isn't forward thinking. It's not innovation. And if people want to adopt it, it's fine. It just doesn't count under our rubric of what transformational change is about. So I think for our principals, the teams, those people listening in, if we're really talking about innovation, we're some, talking about something quite different. So, so what does that mean? And that's where we're headed for this conversation. So what makes it different to call it innovation and a, heading us into transformational change. The first criteria I think is that instead of it being teacher-centered, it's learner-centered. And that fundamental shift starts to change everything about it right away. Because a lot of what we've done has been about teachers being in charge of delivering instruction, covering material, standing in front, directing traffic. When you start to flip it all of a sudden, then you have a different lens. Where do you think the, the next phase of the notion of real innovation might land? Well, I do love that your notion that we have to flip it so that students actually are at the heart of it. And, you know, we've talked this, we've talked this way in education for a while, but when you actually still go into classrooms and you watch the way it's, it's occurring, um, you know, differentiation has been the buzzword for decades. You know, how do we differentiate for students? How do you make sure that every student in that classroom is learning and getting what they want? If we, if we could do that, if we could ideally do that, then boy, that would be transformative, wouldn't it? But a piece that to me philosophically, you know, transformation to me philosophically, also I think we have to step back and think about um, why are we schooling? You know, what is, what's the, the end goal of schooling? And is it really so that we, you know, so that we can make sure that 20% of our students actually make it all the way through calculus at the end of year 12? Or is it so that we, we actually create a, a citizenry so that we actually create a, a community of individuals who truly um, are collaborative, who truly care about each other, who truly, um, I, I have no problem with high standards. You know, you and I, we've worked together long enough to know that we, we expect a lot of the students whom we teach, but we also work with our students a lot to help them meet those, those high expectations. But we don't have a winner takes all mentality in our in our courses, and that's that's another big piece. So I think you know it's it's putting students at the center, and also perhaps the the transformation is rethinking the why. Why are we doing this? Yeah, that's great. Then maybe the third is around this notion of what curriculum is. So in the past, it's been how much we would have covered by a certain period of time, and making sure that the key learning outcomes were not necessarily mastered, but they were addressed. So kids had a go at them. And I think an, another way to think of a curriculum, and this is a non-literature based definition, this is just John's flaky one. And that is curriculum is relationships with a common agenda. So if we took the first two components of what we just said, which is that it's student or learner centered, and this next component of it, you remember the why, about really building a better young person and a better planet with a caring ethos. And then what we're gonna to try to do together is build relationships. And the agenda might be something the state has given us a list of things to cover. It might be ones teachers have modified. There may be expectations in a world history class or something with history in it for sure. But the journey isn't covering it and getting through it until it's the holiday break at the end of the year. It's that we really seize the moment of embracing this inquiry approach to, to digesting the potential of what it is the key concepts are in that. To be a really clever thinker, to really understand that history is invented anyway. Upon the moment an event happens, somebody's interpretation is actually a fictionalized version. And the correlation of that to what fake news or real news is a fuzzy, fuzzy math. So how do you actually know something in the past has actually taken place? Even if you have a photograph of it. it it's a, there's strange realities now when we start to think about what content is in, the, in our knowledge. So I think this third part is really redefining what curriculum is to building relationships, which is where the power, I hope after post COVID, we've got our community remembering that mm -hmm. teachers in classrooms with kids, actually there's a magic of, a, of an ethos that happens different than it does through these airwaves. And with that, 
the power of that relationship can drive kids to be inqui inquirers, to be passionate, to be excited, to really be intrinsically motivated, to want to know more. And if we get that kind of a learner, like uh, your amazing kids, it, it doesn't, it just keeps rolling because they take it on board themselves to just learn at rates be, well beyond what we might have projected in a traditional syllabus. Mm -hmm. So those first three might be different than we would have had from the textbook in, so how do you define change? We're starting with the learner. We're, we're trying to make sure that we're building this around why and what we do schooling for. And we're going to try not to rush through stuff. We're actually going to figure out how to build relationships with young people so that when we get to that stuff, um, it's actually exciting, dynamic, and their passion can take part of it, which assumes it may not be the same for each class, even taught the same in the same year, but certainly over time, each journey through with a different group of students will have a different feel. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I think um, what's transformation, I think, um, you know, what counts as innovation, I, I think also thinking about the structures that are in place, thinking about the fact that we still have children who come to school, they arrive at eight o'clock and we say, sit here for 20 minutes, then move here for 40 and then move here for 40. And now we're going to separate you into this group and this group. We have lunch at this time. And of course you can't sit with your friends at lunch because you're not in the same class. And we have all these arbitrary rules and structures of these conventions that have dogged mm -hmm. education for, for, for a century. Um, part of, you know, part of innovation is looking at what is and saying, does it have to be that way? So I, th I think that's, you know, structurally, um, one more piece I, I might, tag on that is, you know, we talk about putting children front and center. The other piece is let's figure out a way to really be innovative in terms of bringing families back into school. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we have too many families that are detached, disengaged from schools because either they don't feel engaged or the schools have leaders or staff members who just are way too busy to make the efforts they need to be making. So we need to be making a better effort to bring schools and families closer together again. And that implies to me the heart then of what might be the icing around this, and that is the pedagogy. So if we do what you say, that informs a different pedagogy than currently, that families are part of the pedagogy. And if we think about the relationship component and then the, the notion of why, and we come, come back to the learner-centered, what we want to do is move away from assuming that the, the the covering of materials, which allows for much more didactic approaches to be the best way, because I can talk fast and you can listen fast and then there'll be a test. Now, all of a sudden, we slowed down and said, what is the way that would actually create really deep learning for our learners, but in the context of families and communities? And with this ethos that we're trying to build really amazing people who will thrive in their lives ahead. If we do that, the pedagogy becomes very, very, very engaging rather than disengaging that the sacrifice is we're not going to get to as much the benefit is we're going to go deeper and for each child that's a different depth because of just their passion and their interest on any particular topic or theme or outcome that we're trying to 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 get through so i think what we want to focus on here in, in this last part of this is so what pedagogies count as innovation because people will often say, does that mean you're against lecturing? I'll say I'm not against lecturing. I'm against only lecturing. Mm -hmm. That it should be the last resort, not the first. And make a great presentation might necess be necessary. But right now, we actually don't need a lot. Uh, as this mode has thought of, we, we have all the great speeches in world history that have either been filmed live, and now we have them, or in prior to film, have been recreated through cinema, television, or, or theater. So basically, a teacher doesn't have to do a lot of that. It's right there. It's just a click away to bring to your class. So when we spend time lecturing, we probably have failed to get imaginative about another way to do it. What are some of those ways that pedagogically you think count as actually innovation, Scott? Well, I, I'm a big believer in um, actually engaging in pedagogies that are making a difference in your in your world. So... You know, this is again going back. We're not we're not not necessarily looking forward. I'm looking backwards. But there is there is a long history of of research and examples and high quality 
schools that are built around the idea that these schools can make a difference in their communities. Mm -hmm. So one idea behind pedagogy that would actually make a difference is why not um, get groups of students engaged in solving local issues, local problems. Um, bring in the mayor, bring in, <laughs> bring in the local waterworks um, uh, CEO, have these people pitch. These are the problems we're facing. Um, boy, we're, we happen to be in the middle of a pandemic right now. Um, there's opportunities for schools to be thinking about how do we communicate around the pandemic? How do we actually get our students thinking around, around issues related to um, working collaboratively? What would be some research they could be doing to better understand what's happening to the world around them? Yeah, that's great. So I think that's a pedagogy of, of involvement and, and community vision and thinking big picture about the results that could plug into almost any content that was believed to need to be knowledge base of students. That's, that's a really good example. I think if we think about then, there's also a potential then that any of the work might have an audience, uh, an audience bigger than that classroom from yeah. young kids to older kids. There's another, I think, pedagogical uh, framework that works for some of the content, and that is to worry less about answers than questions. Mm -hmm. So if we're trying to build inquiry approaches in kids to ask questions, the implications of any decision will lead to potentially positive and negative issues. You know, so back in the turn of the 20th century, the automobile was actually a solution to the methane and disease issues in big cities like Paris and London and Sydney, New York, where because of cow, uh, horse manure and the incredible dirtiness of most of the conditions of the sewers in those cities at the time, fleas and ticks and all the various things were creating all this pollution that was causing disease. So cities were very unhealthy. So the automobile cleaned that up, paved roads and automobiles. We didn't need the horse-drawn buggy. We didn't need the horses. Now, the automobile then became itself a pollutant. And of course, a large portion of our issues with climate change are the over-reliance on of, um, gasoline, petroleum product that has to be burned and the carbon that goes in the atmosphere as a result that the whole 20th century was built on. So we're going to spend a large part of this 21st century undoing the need to have everybody with a carbon-based engine mm -hmm. running around the place. So one solution actually created a problem. I think we haven't thought of that in the way in which we teach that the pedagogies, how are you saying, look, here's the answer. There's one answer. It's the right answer as opposed to, well, if we do it this way, there's an answer. If we do it that way, there could be two other answers. But if we didn't do it at all, that would lead to something else. That in some of the content areas, it's not just about guess C if you don't know it. It's about that maybe B and D are correct. Mm -hmm. Depends on what we do or what we think or whether we come from the bush or we come from the city. We're so certain in our assessment that we might be driving kids away from having multiple responses and multiple answers. Maybe, maybe certain things, two plus two maybe is usually four, but on most things we're actually trying to teach at a high level, maybe it, the answer leads to another question. I'm not sure we're comfortable with that and I'm not sure we know how to assess that. Well, I think we need to get comfortable with it um, because I've, I've heard you, I've seen you do this in um, multiple presentations where you make it very clear to the audience that Teachers, we don't need teachers standing in front of a room sharing the right, sharing the answers. We the, the idea of facts, you know, facts and figures and dates and timelines. Um, we have, you know, we have Google, we have Siri, we have Alexa. We <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of resources out there right yeah. now to answer those things for us. Um, so I think this notion of getting used to ambiguity, getting used to asking the important questions. I, I think that is, that, is that innovation? Yes, that's, that's definitely innovation because that is where we're going with education. Yeah, so we've just charted three or four uh, criteria for pedagogy that might be a twist on what we typically would do. It takes confident schools, confident school leaders, confident teachers to divert away from, we're just gonna get to chapter 23 or four by the end of the year, and then we feel like we've ticked the boxes. But we know that it's happening all around. The best teachers have always done this anyway. Once they shut the door, the magic is happening. But we're gonna to have to do this across whole schools. And I think the challenge for our colleagues is how to drive forward on this and use the COVID opportunity to say, you know, we never thought anything online was gonna actually happen. Now we did the whole thing online. What can we learn from that? What can we bring back? 
what do we not need to do in school that protects that time to do some of the things you were just describing? So I'd like to throw out a task, Scott, if we could, to our group that they can uh, take or leave for the next time we meet. Um, see what you think about this, because we didn't rehearse this at all. I believe that one of the old school approaches that still works is using Bloom's taxonomy. And Benjamin Bloom out of the 1950s with his team with Kraftfall and the other great thinkers put together this taxonomy, which allows there to be sort of a gradation of the level of engagement students bring based on the verbiage that teachers use in their learning objectives. So a lot of what we do to assess students now in the big assessments is pretty factually based pretty easy to mark, pretty simplistic yes or no or right or wrong or remembering answers to questions. When we get up higher from knowledge to comprehension and we get into application and synthesis evaluation, we really get into some things that are much more like you were describing. When we do that, it sounds like impossible because teachers will have to do more. So all I'm going to ask our teachers and the leaders of teachers to look at is could we for the rest of this year when we're formulating a formative assessment is to just go one layer higher on Bloom's taxonomy. Do an analysis of what you're asking kids to do. And if it's typically been remembering, reciting, comparing, contrasting, doing Venn diagrams and some things which are easy to mark and they're, they're okay, but they're really not gonna be remembered much longer than the period of time we're in it, not going to be learning for a lifetime. Take that one. What would it look like if we started with a student perspective? What if we looked like if families were involved? What if it looked like if there was a question at the end of that? What would it look like if there was an audience? Go one layer higher. And if you get stuck, let students help develop them. Let them develop that assessment, which itself is assessment, because they're thinking through and figuring out what the key learning was and propose it. And a lot of that could use some of the technology that we've been using over the last few weeks and months, depending where in the world you're listening to this. But let's take it one step. Let's not try to get to the other side of the end of this. Maybe that's a senior project your twins are working on now. But for the other stuff, let's just go one step higher. With students get more engaged because of that, and they get more intrinsically motivated as a result, a lot of the boredom that is called disengagement will be left behind. And then teachers will have more confidence to go to that next level. The goal is not that teachers have more to mark, more to take home, you know, more to worry about. Just let's go one step. And it's sort of like not, if you've never run a 5K, don't, don't try to run it. Let's, let's walk 100 meters to start. And maybe by three months from now, we'll get to that point. So if, if teachers are worried that going really full on, engaged, personalized learning, really transformative pedagogy is a little bit much, start with moving up Bloom just one step in the next formative assessment and see if you don't start to get some results. The kids are more fired up, their learning is more powerful. And then the risk is you're not gonna teach as much. So you have to have the confidence that aren't you just really glad they're learning this better. So for the key fundamental things you hope to teach, try this out. And of course we offline and with our school colleagues can help them think this through more specifically. This is just a random conversation in the middle of a hibernation period and social isolation. <laughs> I like that. That's a great idea. And I think people need to, if you're a teacher or you're a school leader, you, you can't worry about, is this, is this transformative? Is this, you know, is this highly innovative? Because quite honestly, wherever you are in your classroom or in your school, if you move from there forward, if you move from there to a higher level, um, that's, that's, that's innovative. That's innovative for your students, for your families, for your staff. So I fully encourage people to embrace this challenge. And I think I'm gonna give an example, and it doesn't mean that this one is the one you would use, but it's one that around the world is probably in everybody's memory banks, even though they're not thinking about it now. Um, do you remember how the movie Titanic ends? Yes. Yeah, so there's a scene just before the ending where mm -hmm. Jack and Rose are in the water and Rose is holding on to this door by being up on it and Jack is sort of holding on under the water and she lets him go. She says you'll never let him go and then she lets him go. Celine Dion had a big song about it. She Actually, they both would have fit on the door. You can Google that and see the physics of it is he didn't need to die, but that's a different story. If we were learning about the notion of a protagonist in English class, the protagonist is the good guy, the, the, usually where the arc of the story is centered around. The antagonist is usually the opposite. In most classic literature, it's pretty obvious who the protagonist is. It's, it's the person that is really the frame of the story is surrounding. 
probably the shows on Netflix you and I are watching during these times have a clear protagonist. And if they don't, it's probably why you haven't gotten to episode two, because there's some weird stuff out there. You don't even figure out what's going on. Okay, there's the good guy. There's the bad guy. I can keep going. So in Titanic, who was the protagonist, Scott? Was it Jack or Rose or was it the ship itself? You know, it's a wonderful question. Um, I, would, I would assume it's Jack. He's the one who put his life on the line and let himself go. Yeah. So you could argue that, and I think it's a fair argument. If we had a really group activity here, it'd be fine. If we had um, made the case for Rose, I think James Cameron has it as Rose, because the movie starts with her as an old woman kind of coming awake and then going to sleep at the end when, when she dies. So I think he believes it's Rose. I could equally argue Jack. You could also say it's the ship because we, it's called Titanic, it's not called Jack or Rose. And so kids would have to defend that position, okay? So in a lesson about learning about what a protagonist is, we leave that behind. We're assuming that in five seconds, people will know that. You know, in Superman, who's the protagonist? Oh yeah, Superman. You know, it's like kids get that, they got it. They'll never forget it. We didn't have to teach it with a worksheet. But now, you make the case of who is the protagonist. Is it the ship? Is it Jack? Is it Rose? Or make some other case. I'll argue it's one of those three. Now rewrite the last scene of the movie. Because I don't think it ends well if it's any of those three. Mm -hmm. I think it's a failed ending. And since it's mostly fictionalized, there's some truth to the story. There was a ship Titanic. It did sink and some people survived and some people didn't. But the Jack-Rose combination is loose history. So rewrite it. Rewrite it to make you finish with that protagonist. Because I'm not satisfied if it's Jack. I'm not satisfied. He didn't have to die. So would you make him live? If it's Rose, is it, if it's not obvious, then make it obvious. What happened in her life besides she was on a ship looking for that Titanic later on in her life where James Cameron takes her out, looks down into the ocean for it. And if it's a ship itself, make that case in the last scene. Maybe it's Titanic's baby brother that's built and it's really unsinkable. And because in doing that, you will never ever misunderstand what classic literature has in it. In Romeo and Juliet, who are the protagonists? Oh, it might actually be Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. And do, would you say it's one or the other? Or you start to look at things differently. So just by changing an assessment rather than define protagonist, I'm, and I'm putting out Titanic only because it has this universal knowledge somehow that you know, everybody kind of knows its story. You could also have kids come up with another example and defend it. I just went two or three layer, layers on higher on Bloom. And in doing so, got kids interested in rethinking, use their imagination. We may just need an outline or a storyboard. We don't need a million word text. But all of a sudden that I'm talking about this, I'm interested in this. You might even think about this the rest of the day. You'll never forget protagonist, which was ultimately what I wanted. Now, is that worth spending two hours on in class and an hour of a kid's time for homework? I'm not arguing it is, but take, so take something you think is and replug in my strategy for how do you make it something that students will get involved in, engaged in, make personal, have a little fun with. They can use some multimedia and multi-sensory approaches and may never forget. So if we take those key terms, key concepts, key ideas, that are the ones that we want to stick. Now you could argue, I didn't give a good one just now and that's fine. Oh, no, I, give, give, me, give me one. I like and, it. Uh, and then let's, let's make it so powerful that in 20 years they go, I remember when we rewrote the end of Titanic and I always remember that. Um, what if every learning moment had that potential rather than you don't even remember much of anything you did in year four or year five or year six? You know you were there, but you don't remember much of any of it. Mm -hmm. I think we can do better than that. And that's where we really get what is innovation. We don't have to look for a new recipe or a new technology. It really is in the power of teachers to just do a little twist on what they've been doing and get kids interested and watch the magic happen. I think that's a wonderful example, John. I'm looking forward to hearing what our, um, what our listeners do in their courses. Yep, well, this has been episode 15 of our podcast series. Scott, you wanna close us down and tell us what might be ahead in future episodes? Sure, well, thank you. Thanks once again for joining us. We've enjoyed the conversation, hope you have. Um, we will, of course, as we're focusing on innovative leadership and transformative times, we'll, of course, be bringing on some principles moving forward. We have a lot of a lot of principles across Australia and perhaps bring some more international principles in to talk to us about how they're coping in this new reality. So we're hoping you continue to join us for this ride because it's been it's been enlightening for us. And yeah, thank thanks. You. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Great to see you. We'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye.